a UNC virologist who's collaborated on research with the Wuhan Institute of Virology's Shi Zheng Li told congressional investigators he has long been worried about biosafety protocols inside China, according to very revealing documents obtained by Vanity Fair. Now, in January, this coronavirologist, Ralph Barrick, testified before two GOP-led House committees that are investigating the origins of COVID-19, and now we're finally getting some testimony from that. Ralph Barrick had repeatedly told Peter Daszak, other people involved in the funding and financing of coronavirus research in China, that after COVID-19 broke, he said, you can't rule out the lab origin, you just can't. He said the Wuhan lab in particular had insufficient biosafety standards. He said the paper cited as evidence that the wet market origin is, is the explanation said that that is not persuasive. Clearly the market was a conduit, he wrote, for expansion. Is that where the pandemic started? I don't think so. Barrick said while he thinks it is statistically more likely that COVID-19 originated from nature, he could not at all rule out the possibility of an accidental lab leak because of what he considers dangerously inappropriate levels of biosafety in China. Joining us now to discuss is Emily Kopp, an investigative journalist with U.S. Right to Know, who has covered the COVID-19 pandemic extensively and is looking into its origins. Great to have you with us to break down some really interesting news on this front. Great to be here. So Ralph Barrick has been, you know, one of the, the names, one of the characters involved in this drama of working out where COVID came from and, you know, what the U.S. government knew at one point and how um, the experts who kind of aligned with Fauci were able to change the narrative to, no, 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 it really couldn't have been a, a lab origin. Um, what have we learned in, in these last two days as we find out the, the reservations, it seems that he was expressing all, all the while, all the, all the, as this is happening, very concerned about biosafety in Wuhan. Right. I mean, Ralph Barrick is probably the world's leading coronavirus virologist. He innovated a lot of techniques around engineering um, synthetic viruses to see what they would do and making them more pathogenic or infectious in the lab. And he also collaborated closely with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So it's a major revelation that in private emails in 2020, he appears to have been agonizing over the fact that some of the work proposed around, again, doing this sort of gain of function virology that makes viruses more dangerous was being undertaken in a BSL-2 lab. And just for context for your viewers, BSL-2 labs don't have adequate protections for airborne viruses. And of course, we know SARS-CoV-2 is an airborne virus. So if they had found something like a progenitor to SARS-CoV-2 and had been working with furin cleavage sites or doing other sort of tinkering to make it more dangerous, that would have been an inadequate biosafety level. Um, it's unfortunate that we're only discovering this because there is a committee investigation and because they subpoenaed his records and because he was dragged into you know this hearing room um, and subjected to um, you know having to testify under penalty of perjury, I wish the American scientists who were most familiar with the work going on in Wuhan before the pandemic had raised their hands early on and said, we have these concerns. Um, and instead they let the narrative dominate that it was conspiratorial to even talk about it. Yeah, Emily, I'm curious about how significant the gap between his private reservations or you know ambivalence about the possibility that lab leak theory could be real and his public statements really were was he basically not saying anything about covid origin all of this time or was he affirmatively saying that he did not think that there was any possibility that lab leak origin or lab leak theory could be real while privately saying well yeah it's absolutely a possibility Right. Well, Barrick has been a little bit of an enigma, actually. I think being this world leading expert in coronaviruses, people wanted to hear from him. But given the scrutiny of his collaboration with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, he sort of receded. Um, he did give a briefing to congressional staffers, people who had a lot of influence over 
you know, the policies we were going to implement in subsequent weeks and around February 2020. And I think he mentions bat soup and, you know, mentions wet markets and doesn't mention, oh, by the way, we were looking at viruses just like SARS-CoV-2 at our partner lab a couple miles away. Um, He didn't volunteer the information that they were particularly interested in a lot of the features that we see in the genome of the novel coronavirus, including the fear and cleavage site, um, including the fact that its spike was um, 10 to 25% different than SARS, which is exactly what they were um, intending to research immediately before the pandemic. So, So I think you could argue he misled uh, congressional aides in February 2020, but then he sort of receded from public view. It's also clear from his testimony that he gave to congressional investigators that he was speaking to Fauci very early on. He was speaking to some of the virologists who would later go on to say very publicly that the lab leak theory was a conspiracy theory. Did he communicate to them what he was communicating privately to other um, scientists around his concerns about the biosafety level? Was he being that candid with people who were influencing public discussion and public policy? I don't think he was. So, um, so, so that's interesting. Right. It's, it's interesting. He was being very candid with Peter Dasick, right? As far as I can tell, he was telling Peter Dasick, head of Eco Health Alliance and like the foremost defender of gain of function research that, are you kidding me? These safety standards in China are woefully inadequate. We've warned them repeatedly. You you think this couldn't have happened there? You're totally wrong. That's BS. I mean, this is pretty some pretty frank language he's using with, you know, the other very significant name in the whole potential lab leak origin dialogue. Exactly. Yeah, he said, don't insult my intelligence by telling me that BSL2 is adequate for this sort of work. I, I wish he had, um, again, done the patriotic thing and told the American people that he had these concerns very early on. Um, so so that's unfortunate. And I think, you know, speaking of Dasik and his testimony yesterday, in addition to having the world's leading coronavirus virologist having these concerns about the biosafety level in Wuhan, we also have sort of the world's leading virus hunter who also worked very closely with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, finally admitting after some pretty I think skilled cross-examination that yes, the Wuhan lab does have viruses that are not published. They have possibly up to three years of virus hunting expeditions and discoveries that they have not published in the scientific literature. And that is also, in addition, a, a huge departure from the public narrative for many years that all of their work is public. There's no way that they could have a progenitor to SARS-CoV-2 in their freezers. Um, when push came to shove and Dasik was actually presented with the facts, he was forced, he was sort of compelled to admit, yeah, it's possible that they have viruses that we're not familiar with. So I think these two pieces of information coming from probably the two scientists with the most information about the Wuhan Institute of Virology is a huge break in the story. And your organization, U.S. Right to Know, was written about in Politico, I saw this week, where they had a, uh, uh, their scientific expert told, uh, you know, uh, attacking your efforts to get more information, uh, your, your journalism to get more information about what happened, saying that it's um, deliberate malice mixed with scientific ignorance, and it's been incredibly um, harmful. So you seem to be um, <laughs> angering uh, people on the other side of this debate, or I guess who just don't think there even should be a debate. Well, <laughs> I think... <laughs> I disagree. Um, I think that, well, I disagree with the characterization of me, obviously. Um, I think that there are a group of virologists who saw the potential for career advancement by um, defending the legacy of Anthony Fauci, of protecting NIAID, which oversees billions of dollars in virology grants and who stake their reputation on the pandemic starting at the wet market and any other theory being a conspiracy theory. And many of them did that very early on before we had much of this other evidence. And 
Um, I think what I'm doing is possibly detrimental to their careers, but I don't think it's detrimental to public health or, um, or anything like that. I think, you know, my only motive is to help us prevent this from ever happening again. So, um, yeah. And, well, and we, uh, yeah. I, I, I just want to, we want to prevent it from happening again. And I would just want to know the truth. If it, if it is an animal origin, if it came from the wet market, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't change my life. It doesn't, it just, I, I genuinely, this is a mystery that I think we, that, you know, this. Well, no, but it's more than that. But the, yeah, the, the, the point should be that there should but, be accountability. That's what I wanted to ask you about, Emily. Like all of these revelations coming out, so many years have passed. You're saying that now there's a revelation that they had um, not published all of the viruses they had at present and could have had a progenitor to the COVID virus that ultimately ended up killing so many scores of people globally. Are we at a point where knowing that is the case, there's still a possibility to do an investigation to see if that is in fact true, if there was a COVID progenitor or has so much time elapsed that basically all evidence is gone and that the kind of the evidentiary crumb trail that could have actually led to accountability for some of these institutions is basically up in smoke, which is now why Vanity Fair, uh, an outlet that hasn't shown a particular amount of interest in lab leak origin, at least in the early days, is now free to write these kinds of pieces. I think that is a matter of some debate. So I remain optimistic that we can get those sequences. Um, I think the fact that Daszak was forced to admit yesterday that there could be unpublished viruses at the Wuhan Institute of Virology provides an avenue for we the public to demand NIH to essentially uncover every stone. Um, we have FOIAs submitted to GenBank. It's sort of the world's leading repository for genetic sequences for metadata. So say a virologist found something like SARS-CoV-2, submitted it, and then deleted it. We want to see that. Um, so I think because of the enormity of the pandemic, we kind of owe it to the public to do everything we can. But there are a lot of people, even who believe it started at the lab, who are saying China deleted all of, all the data, and um, and we'll we'll never know. So, so I think that's a matter of some debate. But on the accountability piece too, um, in his testimony yesterday, Dasik gave some pretty frightening comments because I don't think he's ever been made to answer really critical questions. And he was very defensive and sort of in denial about the fact that the FBI and the Department of Energy both believe that this could be a lab leak. And the things that he was saying, I mean, he was essentially defending um, doing just this sort of research in BSL-2. He totally denied that this, that there was any um, Chinese military involvement at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. He denied that a lot of his research should be subject to more rigorous regulations because of what I think is a, a flimsy loophole. So this is someone who has not internalized the fact that we need to improve our biosecurity, biosafety in response to the possibility that 20 million people died because of a lab leak. And so the longer we go without transparency and accountability, the more federal funding people like this can continue to receive. And um, the they, they have indicated that they will continue to take risks in their research. And I think after the pandemic that we've all experienced, that is, um, intolerable, frankly. So, Dr. Frankenstein, unrepentant is the joke uh, I make. Uh, thank you so much, Emily Kopp, for your journalism and for helping us work through this. We really appreciate it.